Ed Excel specimen paper one. And you know what? I'm just going to smash it out, right? So let's go. So the curve C has equation y equals 3x to the 4 minus 8x cubed minus 3. Find out about the x graph. This is standard, isn't it? It's differentiation and it's a polynomial. So all we do is multiply the power by the term. Take one away from the power. So 3 times 4 is 12. Take one away from the power. 8 times 3 is 24. Take one away from the power. 3 is just 3x to the 0. So if I do 0 multiplied by everything, I'll just get 0. So that is done. Look how easy it is, right? Second derivative, what we're going to do, we just differentiate the first derivative, right? So same thing again. 3 times 12 is 36. Take one away from the power. 2 times 24 is 48. Take one away from the power. Done, part B. Look at this. Uh, verify that C has a stationary point when x equals 2. Stationary points, they just occur when the derivative, the dy by dx, is equal to zero. In other words, the solutions to this equation will be the x-coordinates of the stationary points. So I can take out a common factor here. I can take out 12. I can also take out x squared. So what would I be left with? I'd be left with x minus 2 in here. So which would lead me to believe that either 12x squared equals zero or that x minus 2 equals 0. So the solution to these equations are just x equals 0 and x equals 2. So there was a stationary point at x equals 2. It would have also been acceptable to just sub x equals 2 into this because you are also showing that when x equals 2, the derivative is 0. So either way there. Determine the nature of this stationary point given a reason for your answer. This is why we get the second derivative. Because if the second derivative is less than zero, the stationary point is a maximum. If it's greater than zero, it's a minimum. And if it is zero, it's a point of inflection. So what we're going to get here, we are going to sub n x equals 2 to this. So we're going to say when x equals 2, the second derivative is equal to what? I seem to have lost it already. It's going to be 36 times by 2 squared minus 48 times by 2. Just get your calculator. We're not trying to impress anyone. 36 times by 2 squared, which is 4, right? Minus 48 times 2 is going to get me 48, which is greater than 0. Therefore, this is a minimum point. Question 1, done. All right, question two. The shape ABCDOA, as shown in figure one, consists of a sector cod of a circle center O joined to a sector A will be of a different circle, also center O. Given that the arc length CD is three, cod is 0.4 radians, and AOD is a straight line of length 12, find the length of OD. Okay, well, let's look at OD. What is it? OD is the radius of this pizza slice on the right, isn't it? So... Can we think of anything that relates this radius to other pieces of information we have? Now, we know the arc length is 3 here. Now, the arc length of a sector, when theta is measured in radians, is just r theta. We know L because we know that L is 3 centimetres. We know theta because it's 0 0.4 and we're told that that is in radians. In other words, 3 is just going to equal to 0.4 r here. So, r is going to be 3 over 0 0.4 and that's it. So, into your calculator, that is going to be 7.5 centimetres. Easy as. Find the area of the shaded sector AOB. Okay, so obviously it's another sector. It's not got the same radius, has it? It's like, it's a smaller radius. Can we work out the radius though? I reckon we can. The radius is going to be OA, isn't it? Look at this. AOD, all of that is 12. We've just worked out OD, which is 7.5. So the radius in this case, the, the AO is just going to be 12, the whole line, minus that 7.5. We're laughing now, aren't we? So this is going to be what? 4.5? Um, the radius of this is going to be 4.5. So then what else do we need? Well, we still need this angle theta. Now, this angle, the AOB, is going to be, look at this, because this whole thing is a straight line, AOD, that's going to be 180 degrees, or pi radians. So if I do pi minus that 0.4, I'm going to get the theta in question, aren't I? So my theta is going to equal pi minus 0.4, 0.4, 
Now, this is obviously some thing, some number that I can round, but I'm going to then use it in further calculations. So I'm just going to keep it as pi minus 0.4, and then when I finally get to working out the area in my calculator, I'm just going to put pi minus 0.4 in, because I don't want to start introducing rounding errors. So the formula for the area of a sector is a half theta r squared, when theta is measured in radians. We've got everything. So it's just going to be a half times pi minus 0.4, times by 4.5, uh, yeah, that's the one, not 7.5, times 4.5 squared. Straight in. So I'm going to do a half bracket pi minus 0 0.4 times by 4.5 squared. And then do we want kind of any kind of accuracy? It doesn't tell us, so I reckon about three significant figures should do the job. So I'm going to say that that's just 27.8 centimetres squared. All right, we're keeping the pace upon this one. Let's have it. So a circle C has equation x squared plus y squared minus 4x plus 10y equals k, where k is a constant. Find the coordinates of the center of C. So coordinates of the center, we're going to need to get the equation of the circle in that nice form. What is that nice form? It is when we have x minus a squared plus y minus b squared equals r squared. And then you can say that the center is just going to be a, b. So how am I going to get that in this case? I'm going to need to complete the square on the x terms and the y terms respectively. So basically, the x terms are x squared minus 4x. So I'm going to complete the square on that. So that's going to be what? I'm going to, I need to half. I need to half the number in front of the x, so minus 2. And then what I do is I take away this number squared. So that's going to be minus 4. So in other words, this thing here is equal to x squared minus 4x. Okay, and then I just need to do the same with the y. So that is y squared plus 10y. So it's going to be plus y plus 5, half of the 10, and then squared minus this thing squared, so minus 25. And then that is going to equal k. Let's clean it up a bit. So I'm going to whip those numbers onto the right-hand side so I can get it into this form. So I'm going to have x minus 2 squared plus y plus 5 squared equals k and then plus 4 plus 25 so that's going to be what plus 29 okay so obviously i've got this unknown k but that doesn't matter because all i care about for part a is the center of the circle in other words the center is going to be what it's going to be 2 and then if this is y minus b and this is a plus 5 the b is going to be negative so this is going to be minus 5 and they are the coordinates of the centre of C. Now, state the range of possible values for K. So let's have a look at this right-hand side and compare it to our general circle. R squared. R is the radius, and then it's going to be squared. What's going to have to happen here for this to be a circle? Well, can R squared be negative? Well, no, it can't, can it? And here's another question. Can R squared be equal to zero? Well, that would basically mean r would be equal to zero, but if the radius was equal to zero, then I've, I've not got a circle, have I? So this is the only way this is going to happen is if this thing here on the right-hand side is positive. So I'm basically just going to need, look, k plus 29 has to be positive. Therefore, k has to be greater than minus 29. That's it. Question four. Looks like we're kind of getting into year 13 stuff here because I'm seeing kind of luns and integrals flying about. So it says given that a is a positive constant and that whole thing equals lun seven, show that a is lun k where k is a constant to be found. Okay, so obviously they're, they're giving us what this integral is, but then there's another one known somewhere at the beginning. So in other words, you don't really have to do anything different than just try and work out this integral, right? You know, work out the left-hand side as if the right-hand side wasn't there and then put it equal to the right-hand side at the end. So in other words, like, what is this integral? How am I going to integrate t plus 1 over t with respect to t? So when you have big fractions in an integral and you have multiple terms on the top and then, like, kind of just one term on the bottom... It is usually a good idea, if you can't see any other way to integrate it, to just rewrite this as separate fractions. In other words, instead of t plus 1 over t, it might be helpful, it might not be helpful, but a lot of the time it is helpful, to instead write t over t plus 1 over t. This helps a lot. 
Why does this help? Because usually the resulting fractions are actually quite simple. So this here is going to be, look, t over t, that's just one, isn't it? And then one over t, I can't really do much to that. Now the integral of one is just gonna be t in this case. The integral of one over t is ln t. This is just something that I want you to know. I'm not gonna go into much detail now. Um, and then I'm basically just at the point where I put my limits in, right? So I'm gonna put 2a into, basically I have a big bracket, sub 2a in for t, and then I'm gonna take away a big bracket, subbing in a for t. So this is going to be 2a plus ln of 2a, and then minus a plus ln of a, okay. Now we just kind of clean it up and see what we can do. So looking at the a's, I've just got a, haven't I? I've got 2a minus a. And then I've got ln of 2a minus ln of a. So let's write both of these terms and then we'll see what we can do with them. Can I use a log law to help me out here? I think I can, because if I have a log take away another log, then that is the same as a log of this divided by this, log laws. So. That's gonna be that. And I think I'm at a good spot now because this thing here is equal to what? Well, what is 2a divided by a? It's just two, isn't it? So a plus ln two is, I think, the most simple way I can express this integral. Now I say, ah, well, this is supposed to be ln seven, isn't it? So this is equal to ln seven, which means that a is just gonna be ln seven minus ln two. Now that's not exactly the answer they want, is it? And that is because we just want a single logarithm. So I'm gonna use another log law, well the same log law again, to put these together. So this is gonna be ln of seven over two. In other words, k is just seven over two in this case. All right, question five, and it looks like we're going parametric. So it says x is 2t minus one, and y is 4t minus seven plus three over t. Show that the Cartesian equation of the curve c can be written in the form, all of that stuff, a and b of integers. All right, so as long as you know how to get a Cartesian equation, we, the real difficulty in meat of this question is just algebra, it's just playing about with algebra. So Cartesian equation just means look, x's and y's, get rid of the t's. So you can kind of think of it almost as simultaneous equations, right? We've got x equals 2t minus 1, and then y is something that's a bit more confusing. What would it be easier to do? Would it be easier to try and kind of look at the y equation, get t and sub it into the x, or the other way around? Definitely the other way around, right? Because x is a simple linear expression. I can rearrange that for t. So let's do that now. So x equals 2t minus 1 is going to imply that what? x plus 1 is 2t. So t is just gonna be x plus one over two. So straight away I've got t. Inject that into the y and then try and clean things up. So what am I gonna get? I'm gonna get y equals four t, so four times x plus one over two, minus seven plus three over t, so plus three over, and then all of that stuff, x plus one over two. Right, so what we're we gonna have here, let's look. It looks like they're gonna have a denominator of x plus one. Right, so here's what I wanna do. Let's, look at this, I've got four here and then a two here. So I can divide that two into the four. So that's basically two times by x plus one, minus the seven. This two is gonna get flipped to the top here. If you don't believe me, write it out long ways, like kind of three divided by x plus one over two, etc. But it's basically gonna to flip to the top. So this is going to be what? Plus six over x plus one. So it looks like at this point, I wanna simplify this thing here, multiply it by x plus one to get that common denominator, and then I think I should get the answer. So I'm gonna have two x. I'm gonna get a plus two here, but then I'm gonna take away seven, so I'm gonna get minus five. And then I have the plus the six over x plus one. So if I consider this one term, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply that thing by x plus one, so I get a big fraction. So I'm gonna get big old fraction with an x plus one at the bottom. I'm gonna get two x minus five times x plus one, and then I got this six on the end. All right, we know how to do this by now. We know how to do this. So two x times x is two x squared. Two x times one is two x. Minus five times x is minus five x. Minus five times one is minus five. 
Add the six, I think we're on the home straight. So what x squareds do I have? I just got two x squared here. What x do I have? I have plus two x minus five x, so that's minus three x. My handwriting is awful, but that is a minus five, isn't it? There we go. Uh, so the number term, I'm just gonna have minus five plus six, which is plus one. I reckon this is the form they want. Let's quickly check back. They want two x squared, got that plus ax plus b over x plus 1. So I think in this case, a is minus 3 and b is 1. All right, question 6. Looks like party time's over because this looks massive. So a company plans to extract oil from an oil field. Daily volume of oil V is measured in barrels that the company will extract from this oil field depends on the time. T, years after the start of drilling makes sense. Company decides to use a model to estimate the daily volume of oil that will be extracted. Model includes the following assumptions. The initial daily volume of oil extracted will be 16,000. Daily volume of oil that will be extracted four years after the start of drilling will be 9,000. Daily volume of oil extracted will decrease over time. All right, so this kind of makes sense. The diagram below shows the graphs of two possible models. Okay, so there's two, so obviously it's like a modeling question. The first way, model A, looks to be a linear model, doesn't it? It's a straight line. Whereas model B looks to be more exponential, doesn't it? It's kind of curving down. Use model A to estimate the daily volume of oil that will be extracted exactly three years after the start of drilling. Okay, so um, if this was like nicely plotted, you know, and you had like graph paper and you knew exactly where all the lines were, you could basically just kind of draw a line nicely there, couldn't you? You know, you could go to three years on T and you should see what the V is. This is just a sketch though. So we kind of need something else. Now we have two points. So I think if we've got the equation of this straight line, then we can start subbing values in to get the value of V. So I'm gonna use this. I'm gonna use Y minus Y1 equals M times X minus X1. I can use either of the points as my X1 and Y1, and to get the gradient, I can do change in Y over change in X with these two points. So if I use the four 9,000 as my kind of second point, it would be 9,000 minus 16,000 would be my change in y, and then my change in x would be four minus zero. Okay, so 9,000 minus 16,000, I believe is gonna be minus 7,000, and then all of that divided by four. Okay, so um, that is gonna be minus 1,750, and then let's use the First point, the naught 16,000 is my x1 and y1. So I'm going to say y minus 16,000 equals m, the minus 1750, times x minus x1, which is going to be zero, which is nice. So what do we get? We get y equals minus 1750x, and then I'm Obviously that's gonna be zero, and then I'm gonna add 16,000 to both sides, so plus 16,000. Okay, so that is my kind of model, but it's not gonna be y and x, it's gonna be v and t, but that, you know, same thing. So v is gonna equal minus 1750t plus 16,000. Okay, so now I can say, well look, if t equals three, let's just quickly check. Yeah, t is, okay, fantastic. So, Basically, I just sub in t equals 3 to this. So, at t equals 3, v is going to equal minus 1750 times 3 plus 16,000. The little check I did then was just to see if t was measured in something else. You know, they really like you to think about units. So imagine t was measured in days or something, but then they asked for years, you'd have to kind of convert the days to years. So it's always worth, you know, always worth checking these things. So putting that to my calculator, I'm going to get... Um, 10,750, fantastic. Write down a limitation of using model A. Well, look at it. It goes underneath the t-axis, doesn't it? Now, does that make sense? Because I mean, you know, the V is basically representing the amount of oil I extract. But I mean, can I extract a negative amount of oil? I don't think they're gonna be putting oil back in, let's put it that way. So you can basically say, you know what it might even be worth? Find out when this model thinks that the V should be zero, right? So, cause the model is clearly not gonna be valid for anything after that. So 
if we were to set v equal to zero in this equation, we're going to get the value of time at which the model just stops being valid. So let's work this out quickly. I'm going to get zero equals minus 1750t plus 16,000. So t is basically just going to be the 16,000 over the 1750, which is going to be 64 over 7. So let's just keep it 64 over 7. It's a nice exact number. So basically, look, this model uh, will defo not to be valid, um, you know, for any value of t greater than 64 over 7 as, as you know, you can't extract a negative volume of oil. Cool, okay, uh, let's have a look at part B. So it says using an exponential model and the information given in the question, find a possible equation for model B. Okay, right, this is a bit harder. So I said that B looks exponential. Now, positive exponentials, they kind of curve up like this, right? T gets greater and they go greater. Negative exponentials is the other way, and that kind of looks like what we have. So they kind of go down like this and curve down like that. So what do negative exponentials look like? It's a number to the power of negative t, or negative x, whatever's on your horizontal axis. So I definitely think that I'm going to have some kind of v equals, and then some number to the negative t, because that is going to be encapsulated by the fact that as t increases, v actually goes down. If it wasn't negative t, t would increase and v would go up. So I don't know what is going to be to the power of this negative t, so why don't I just call it anything, b, right? So it's some kind of b to the minus t. Now that pretty much does it. However, there's one little thing that we need to account for, and that is, well, is there anything in front of this? Because when t equals 0 here, this would just say that v equals 1. But we know that v can't be 1. v has to equal 16,000. So Let's, let's give ourselves another number. Let's call this a, okay? So now I can say, well, wait a minute. When t is 0 here, we know that v should be 16,000. So what I can do is I can sub these two numbers in. So I'm going to get 16,000. It's going to equal a times what? Well, b to the minus 0 is just 1. So I basically get that a is 16,000. And I knew that A was going to be 16,000 because in these exponential models, this number in front is always just the initial value. So this is good. We've got A, so all we really need to do is get B now because that's the only unknown. Now, there is one more piece of information that we have, so we can get this B because we know that when T is 4, B should be 9,000. So what I can do is I can sub those two numbers in. So I'm going to say that 9,000 is equal to, we know the value of A now, it's 16,000 times by b, we don't know the value of b yet, uh, times by minus, and then t in this case should be 4, so minus 4. Cool, so divide both sides by 16,000, that's just going to get me 9 over 16, isn't it? So that's going to be b to the minus 4. So how am I going to get this? Let's do this, let's do this longhand for you. So this is the same as 1 over b to the 4, just so you really get what's going on here. Let's multiply... So I can multiply by b to the 4, divide by all of that. If, let's just flip both sides. I've got two fractions here. So if I was to just flip both sides, I would get 16 over 9 equals b to the 4. And then b is just going to be the fourth root or power of a quarter or whatever you want. The fourth root of 16 over 9. Okay, now I could probably keep this exact because 16 and 9 are both square numbers. Then I can have thirds, but let's get a number, right? So... Let's just put this into my calculator. I'm going to get the fourth root of 16 over 9, which is going to get me to three significant figures, 1.15. Now, I'm probably going to need to use this number in the next part of the question. So this is stored as ants in my calculator now, just to avoid any rounding errors. So like, be sure of that. I'd rather use ants than this 1.15 because that has more accuracy. Okay, so using your answer to the first part of B, estimate the daily volume of oil that will be extracted exactly three years after the start of drilling. So we're actually doing the same thing as we did with the Model A. We're doing that estimation. 
And now we have the model, the equation, it's quite easy to do. So it's going to be V equals 16,000, which is my value of A, times by, now B, so this 1.15, but I will use amps for it, to the minus 3. And then straight in, so 16,000 times by amps to the power of minus 3. That is going to get me 10,000... 392 dot 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 so let's round that to 10,400 sweet okay so question seven is an interesting one in the we've got a triangle so it makes you think kind of you know like geometry trigonometry all of that but then we've been given vectors so let's have a read of this it says you know sketch for triangle abc and instead of just telling you the lengths of these things, it says AB is a vector is 2i plus 3j plus k, BC is i minus 9j plus 3k, and then it says show the angle BAC is 105.9. So we want, getting a diagram up here, this angle, right? My, if we just knew these sides, if it just said 10, 11, 12, right? What would we do? Would we use the cosine rule, wouldn't we? So the question is, like, could it be that simple, though? Can we just get these numbers, you know, these lengths, and then just use the cosine rule? Well, we can, because these vectors, we can get the magnitude of a vector just using Pythagoras, right? So the magnitude of AB, all I need to do is the square root of all of its components. So it's 2 in the i direction, all of its components squared. Uh, it's 3 in the j direction, and it's just 1 in the k direction. So that is all we need to do. So if I was to do the square root of 2 squared, well, that's going to be 4 plus 9 plus 1, which is the square root of 14. So we actually know that length, 14. And then it says BC, we can work out the magnitude of BC, which is going to be what? It's going to be the square root of 1 squared plus 9 squared. So obviously the J component is minus 9, but in terms of its magnitude, it's just, you know, 9 of it, uh, plus 3 squared. That is going to be what? It's going to be... Um, well, well, 81, I suppose, plus 1, plus 9, and then see if that simplifies at all. I don't think it does, so I think square root of 91 would do the job. Okay, so we're almost there, aren't we? But then, wait a minute, it's run out. <laughs> We've not got the other length, and if we were to use the cosine rule, we would need this other length. Why is that? Well, let's write out the cosine rule. It's going to be what? What is the cosine? Well, it's a squared, that's the one, it equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. So, you know, if this was our a, we have got our small a, so we know that this a squared is going to be 91. b squared, we've, we've got, either way, you can call this b or this b, it doesn't matter, but we've got one of them, but we've not got the other. So the problem is, we just need this ac, really. So, can we use anything to do with the fact that they gave us vectors here? So there's an important rule in vectors, right? And it's basically like start in position and end position. If they're the same, you've got the same vector. What I mean by that is, look, okay, if I want AC as a vector, I don't have it, do I? But I don't just need to walk along this line. What if I, if I wanted to start at A and get to C, I went, you know what, let's go to B first, because I know how to get there. I've got a map that tells me how to get to B. And then it tells me from B how to get to C. Well, then I can do that, can't I? I don't know how to get directly to C, but I can do this. And look, they end up in the same place. Same start, same end. It's going to be the same vector. So what I can do here is I can say, well, AC is going to be AB plus BC. I can work that out as a vector. So AB is 2i plus 3j plus k. And then I'm going to add that to BC, which is i minus 9j plus 3k. Simplifying this, I'm going to get my vector AC. So how many i's do I have? I have three of them. How many j's do I have? I have three minus nine, so minus six of them. How many k's do I have? I have k plus 3k, so four of them. So now, do exactly the same as I did with these. So I am going to do the following. I am going to say that the magnitude of AC is going to equal the square root of 3 squared plus 6 squared plus 4 squared, which is going to be what? It's going to be square root of 9 plus 36 plus 16. 
which is the square root of 61. So I know that this is the square root of 61. So at this point, I think I'm laughing because the, the really good thing is I've got all these as square roots, but then they turn up as squares in the question, right? So a squared, in this case, this would be my a. It doesn't matter which way you label b and c in. Don't be fooled by however they are. You know, you can label it how you want. So I am going to get 91 is equal to 14 plus 61 minus 2 times the square root of 14 times the square root of 61 times cos a. Okay, so don't worry about working them out. Keep them like that for now. I want to get all of this over to the left-hand side. So I'm going to get 2 times the square root of 14 times... I wrote 16 here, but I meant 61. This is the thing. You can make mistakes in the exam as long as you find them. So I put them into one square root because that's a third law. I just want to make it simpler for myself. I'm going to take this 91 over to the other side. So I'm going to get 14 plus the 61 and then minus that 91. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to get some more space first. Let's get some more space. So I missed out the cos A here, didn't I? I can get my cos A now, can't I? Because I'm going to do all of this stuff. 14 add 61 minus 91, all divided by 2, times this big old square root. I'm not sure it works anything out yet, have I? Because I don't really need to. I'm just going to wait till the end. And that will give me A as the inverse cos of all of that stuff. Not worked anything out yet, because I don't want to keep going to my calculator. Like, I can just do it at the end. Put it all in at once. Bob's your uncle, right? So, I'm just going to put this in. Hopefully, I'm going to get their answer. So, inverse cos. Make sure you're in degrees here, because look, they want their answer in degrees. So, inverse cos of 14 plus 61 minus 91 over 2 times the square root of 14 times 61 is going to give me, oh, well, if you look at this, 105.8877 dot dot dot, which to one decimal place is 105.9 degrees. All right, what have we here? f of x is limit to x minus 5 plus 2x squared minus 30. Show that f of x equals 0 has a root alpha in the interval 3.54. Right, we're looking for sign changes. Why are we looking for sign changes? Imagine I've got some function, right, does this, f of x, and I want to know where it's zero, right? I want to find this alpha. Well, if I was to, you know, imagine 3.5 was here, and 4 was here, if the root alpha is between 3.5 and 4, look at what's going to happen at 3.5 and 4. At 3.5, my value is negative, and at 4, it's positive. That means at some point in between those two, it must have crossed 0, right? Or vice versa, you know, it could have been going down, this one could have been positive, that would have been negative, but either way, it's going to have to cross 0. Now, this only works if the function is continuous. Imagine I have a discontinuous function, like tan, and it kind of looked like that, and I said, okay, uh, well, you know, this thing here is negative and this thing is positive. That means there's a root between them, well, no, but that's because the function is discontinuous, it just jumps away. So here's the thing, we know that in the interval 3.54, there's nothing discontinuous about my function here, right? I can put in all of these x values, 3.5 to 4, into this function, nothing mad's going to happen. So it is continuous, so I just need to look for this sign change. So I know what my f of x is, and I'm trying to solve that equals 0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to work out f of 3.5 which is going to be ln of 2 times 3.5 minus 5 plus 2 times 3.5 squared minus 30. Ooh, I know, right. This is going to be ln of 7 minus 5 plus 2 times 3.5 squared minus 30, which is like minus 4.8 to 2 sig fig. I don't really care about accuracy. I just care if it's positive or negative. That's negative. Now we're going to work out f of 4, and we're going to hope it's positive. So this is going to be ln 2 times 4 minus 5 plus 2 times 4 squared minus 30. Um, right, just, yeah, same thing again. There's a lot of numbers going on here. Uh, 2 times 4 is 8, minus 5 is going to be 3, so I'll get ln 3 plus 2 times 4 squared minus 
30. And look at that, I get a positive number. And then again, as I said, you know, function is continuous in interval and change of sign. Therefore, you know, the root is in the interval. More than enough to get the max here. Cool, right, what do we have now? Student takes four as the first approximation to alpha, so we're gonna be doing some kind of iteration now. Given that f of four is 3.009 and f prime of four is 16.67, apply the Newton-Raphson procedure once to obtain a second approximation for alpha, giving the answer to three sig fig. Right, to be completely honest with you, if you know nothing about the Newton-Raphson, don't worry. What I do want you to know though, is what is in your formula booklet. You need to be familiar with it, right? If you knew your formula booklet and you had no idea about Newton-Raphson, you could go, oh, wait a minute, I think I saw those words in the formula booklet, right? You go over to the formula booklet, don't have a clue what it means, but you find a little thing and it says, oh, look at this, Newton-Raphson iteration for solving f of x equals zero, which is what we have. And it just tells you, it says, look, x n plus one, equals xn minus f of xn over f prime of xn. So I can go, I go, no idea what this formula means, but wait a minute, <laughs> they've told me how to work it out. So I just sub the numbers in, it doesn't matter, does it? It doesn't matter. Look, we've been given f of four, so that's this thing here. We've been given f prime of four, that's that thing there. And then xn, well, that's gonna be four. So really, we're just gonna get, look, First approximation to alpha, so x1, essentially, is my four. So then x2, my second approximation, is gonna be what? It's gonna be four minus f of four over f prime of four. Here we go, I'm a student, not a clue what this even means. I'm getting full marks, full marks, right? So four minus f of four tells it you, 3.099 over f prime of four. 16.67, and you just work out. It's as simple as that. Learn your formula booklet. So 3.099 over 16.67. Now look, they've given me stuff, okay, to four sig fig, they want the answer to three sig fig. So to three sig fig, my answer is 3.81. Fantastic. Show that alpha is the only root ah, of f of x equals naught. Okay. Uh, Probably gonna be outside of the realms of numerical methods and stuff now. So let's kind of think about what this equation actually is, okay? So the equation is basically ln of 2x minus five plus 2x squared minus 30 all equals zero. Uh, so you could try and sketch something like this. Now, sketching this would be pretty grim. It's like a ln and a quadratic. What if we were to split these two things up? What if I was to try and sketch that thing? And then look, let's take this over to the other side of the equation. What's gonna happen? It's gonna be 30 minus 2x squared. Because here's the thing, I think these two things individually are definitely possible to sketch. So if I was to kind of, you know, sketch y equals this and y equals that, seeing where they're equal to each other are just gonna be the solutions to this equation we're looking for, right? And the, you know, those solutions are gonna to correspond to intersections of the graphs. So if they only intersect at this value of alpha, then we're good, right? However, if they intersect more times, you'll be like, oh, no, wait a minute. That means that there's more solutions to this equation. So I'm gonna just go super rough on these sketches. Let's start with a quadratic. 30 minus two x squared. Well, x squared or two x squared is basically just gonna be, you know, your classic parabola like that. Now, that's gonna be flipped though, because I'm taking it away. So it's basically gonna look like, here we go. I'm gonna do it, look at this. Technology, right? So that would be basically be minus two x squared, but then it's 30 minus two x squared. It's basically gonna go like that, isn't it? Okay, fantastic. It's gonna go on forever, but this is super rough, so you know what I mean. Now, learn looks like that, okay? We've not quite got learn though, we've got a bit of a transformation on it. So, What's gonna happen? Well, I'm gonna be moving it five to the right because that's that minus five. So, you know, something like this. And then I'm going to be stretching it with a scale factor of a half in the X. So maybe that's gonna go a bit further this way. So that's what my learn graph's gonna look like. And now for 
illustrative purposes, I'm going to draw this quadratic a bit better. So that's going to look, you know, something like that. Now, this is going to keep going on forever, and this is going to be asymptotic, isn't it? In other words, they're only going to intersect once, aren't they? One point of intersection, don't intersect anywhere else, so then we are good. So I would just, you know, I would really give, it, give them a bit of English, give them some words. So I would say what? You know, the graphs only intersect once and therefore only one solution of the equation f of x equals zero. And that solution is alpha, basically. Cool, I reckon that'll do the job. All right, nice little one for question nine. It says, prove that tan theta plus cot theta is two cosec of two theta. Right. Can be a bit of an art sometimes, <laughs> proving drug identities. A good place to start, and again, I say it's an art because each situation is a tiny bit different, but a good place to start in general, for most cases, not all of them, would be getting stuff just in terms of sine and cos because then you can you know, put it all together and see if any nice identities come out of it. So tan is sine over cos, and cot is, well, one over tan, so cos over sine. So I suppose there's an immediately obvious thing that I can do here, and I can put that all into one fraction. So the bottom would be cos theta sine theta, and to do that, I'm gonna to need to multiply this sine theta by sine theta, so sine squared theta, and the cos by the cos, so that's going to be cos squared theta. And we can see why we did this, because sine squared plus cos squared is 1. So here's the thing, it's really good to get things into single brackets, because then you can really say, okay, I've got this, I've got this. This comes out loads, it's a classic. Um, so do we remember what the double angle formula for sine is? Well, I do. And that's all that matters. So it's that. Why is this going to be helpful in this case? Because look, we've got half of that here. If sine 2 theta is 2 sine theta cos theta, well, I've got one lot of cos theta sine theta. So in other words, I've got a half sine of 2 theta here. Well, that's nice. Times both top and bottom by 2 to get 2 over sine of 2 theta. But wait a minute. Isn't 1 over sine 2 theta just cosec of 2 theta. Yes, it is. Cool, that's part A. Uh, part B says, hence explain why the equation, what just happened there? There we go. Why the equation tan theta plus cot theta equals one does not have any real solutions. Well, the keyword's hence, right? Obviously, if part A showed us that tan theta plus cot theta is exactly the same as two cosec of two theta, then we're just gonna sub that in, aren't we? It's obvious that this form is going to make it nicer to prove this. So in other words, we're trying to solve the equation 2 cosec of 2 theta equals 1. Okay, well, let's try and solve it. Let's divide both sides by 2 to get cosec of 2 theta equals a half. Now I'm going to flip both sides. So I'm going to get sine theta because sine 2 theta because sine is 1 over cosec. So this is going to be 1 over a half, which is 2. And I think the problem lies here, because look, isn't sine, sine of theta, sine of two theta, whatever, doesn't that lie between one and minus one? So is it ever gonna be two? Well, I don't think it is. And the graphical interpretation of this is gonna be, look, if I've got some sine graph like this, right? This is basically going between one and minus one. So when is it ever? going to be equal to 2? Well, never. There are no intersections of these lines. So that right there is more than enough to prove that that equation does not have any real solutions. Okay, given that theta is measured in radians, prove from first principles that the derivative of sine theta is cos theta. Again, formula book. Everything is in your formula book here. It's such an easy A-level, right? So essentially, it basically tells you that the derivative of a function is the same as the limit as h tends to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. So let's just do that with our sine of theta. So in this case, if f of theta is sine theta, then the derivative 
of my function f of theta is going to be the limit as h tends to zero of sine of theta plus h minus sine of theta all divided by h. Now, we again can use something in our formula booklet because there is a multiple angle formula for sine. Straight in the formula booklet and it basically says that sine of a plus minus b equals sine a cos b plus minus cos a sine b. So we can use that again. Again, in your formula booklet, you're not even remembering anything, are you? Right, so limit of h, limit as h tends to zero, losing the plot here. Okay, so sine of theta plus h is going to be sine theta cos h plus sine h cos theta. Take the sine theta off from the end, and all of this is going to be over h. Okay, so what's this now going to equal? Uh, let's see if we can kind of split this up in a nice way. Look at what we've been given. We've been given the limit of sine h over h, and we've been given the limit of cos h minus 1. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to take a sine of theta out of terms, I'm going to take a cos theta out of terms, and I'm going to see what happens. So this is going to be the limit of h tends to 0 of sine theta, and then what do we have times by sine theta? It's going to be cos h minus 1 all over h. And then what's the last term we have? We have cos theta times by sine h over h. Here we go. So, wait a minute. Isn't the limit as h tends to 0 of cos h minus 1 over h 0? Yes, it is. So we can pie that off. And then limit as h tends to 0 of sine h over h is going to be 1. So this whole thing is just going to be basically cos theta times 1, which is cos theta. Simple as that, right? I didn't even really use anything that I knew then because everything was already in the formula booklet. It was just kind of applying it. So yeah, not a bad five marks. Question 11, let's have it. An archer shoots an arrow. The height h meters of the arrow above the ground is modeled by the formula of that thing, which is a quadratic. D is the horizontal distance of the arrow from the archer measured in meters. Given that the arrow travels in a vertical plane until it hits the ground, find the horizontal distance traveled by the arrow as given by this model. Let's get a bit of a visual representation of what's kicking off here. We're given h, right? We're told it's a quadratic, a negative quadratic, as a function of d, the horizontal distance. So if I've got height and distance here, surely you can think of this graph, if I was to plot it, just as the trajectory of the arrow, right? It's some kind of negative quadratic, so a parabola, an unhappy face, right? Sad face. You can really think of this as what happens to the arrow. It's saying, well, the arrow goes up here and then goes all the way down here. It's the trajectory of the arrow. So the arrow obviously stops when it hits the ground. So if I want the horizontal distance, I'm going to need this point here. Because obviously, when it hits the ground, the height, h, is going to be 0. So all I actually have to do to work this out is set this equation for h as 0. So I just need to write this, and I need to solve it using whatever method I want. It's a quadratic, million ways to solve it. I think the best way, because I'm lazy, is using the calculator. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to menu, I'm going to go down to equation funk, this is a polynomial, and it's a polynomial of degree 2, because it's a quadratic. The degree is the highest power in this polynomial. Calculator is going to say x, we've got d, same thing, you just need to put your coefficients in. So the coefficient of x squared, or d squared in our case, is minus 0.002. Coefficient of x, or d, is 0.4, and the number on the end is 1.8. That's going to get me two solutions. It's going to get me d equals 204 meters to 3 sig fig, or minus 4.40 meters. Well, do we want this negative distance? No, we don't. That is got from, essentially, we're setting this whole equation equal to zero, so that would correspond to the solution down here. Again, we don't care about that. We just want the positive distance, obviously. So what we care about is this 204 meters. 
Cool. With reference to the model, interpret the significance of the constant 1.8 in the formula. <laughs> what would happen if d was zero? So when d is zero, h would be what? Well, it would be 1.8 plus 0 0.4 times zero minus 0 0.002 times zero squared. In other words, it would be 1.8. So look at this on the graph. When d is 0, h is 1.8. Okay, so right at the start, the arrow is 1.8 meters above the ground, right? Archer gets the arrow exactly 1.8 meters above the ground and then shoots it up this way. So in other words, 1.8 is basically just the vertical height above the ground right at the start. So, you know, however, the, however you want to say it, right? It's like maybe the initial... So 1.8, you know, initially the arrow is 1.8 meters above the ground. I think that will do the job. Right, what do we have for part C? Right, 1.8, okay, so the quadratic we have. In the form a minus b times d minus c squared. Okay, it's completing the square here. Now, the annoying thing about this is that Usually with completing the square, it's nice if we just have like x squared plus 4x or whatever, or just like x squared minus. It's nice if the x squared, or in our case d squared, coefficient is just 1. It's not negative, there's not a 0 0.002 here in front of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to factorise that coefficient out. So then inside the brackets, I've got d squared, and I can complete the square on that. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take 0 minus 0 0.0, 0 so many noughts. Minus 0 0.002 out of the first or the last two terms in this. In other words, the d squared term and the d term. So by design, I'm going to get d squared. We know that. And then to get the d term, I'm going to have to do 0 0.4 divided by this. So when I multiply them out, I get 0 0.4. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do 0 0.4 divided by minus 0 0.002. And I'm going to get minus 200. Good. So this is still going to have a D in it, of course. And then the 1.8, I'm going to leave that chilling on the outside. I don't care about putting that in my brackets. Now I'm going to complete the square within these brackets, okay? So I'm going to do... Why is my voice going? I need to half the coefficient of D. So it's D minus 100 all squared. And then I take this term squared away. So that's just going to be a 1 with four zeros after it. And then what I'm going to do, I've actually completed the square now. I just need to tidy it up. So the first thing is multiplying back out these brackets. So minus 0.002d minus 100 all squared. And then this is going to be what? It's going to be plus 0.002 times 10,000. Is that going to be 20? Let's see. So 0.002 times by 10. It's going to be 20. Cool. So that's going to be plus 20 and then plus this 1.8 on the end. Obviously, I can put these two terms together. So I'm going to get 21.8 minus 0.002 d minus 100 squared. I think that's the form that they want it in because they want a minus, here we go, b times d minus c all squared. Perfect. So that's exactly the form that they wanted. All right, part D. Uh, it's decided that the model should be adapted for a different archer. All right. The adapted formula for this archer is h equals 2.1 plus 0.4d minus 0.002d squared. Okay, super similar to the other one, isn't it? Actually, the second two terms are exactly the same. So the only thing that's different is the 1.8 and the 2.1. So if you go to the initial model here, the only real difference is that my new guy is just going to be, is just going to start off about 30 centimetres higher. And then everything else is going to happen exactly the same way. It's just going to be sat above it, basically. So let's see what they're actually asking me. So the maximum height of the arrow above the ground. Okay. So here's what I'd do. Maximum points you can get from completing the square with quadratics. Now... We've completed the square for the old quadratic, but as I just said, the only difference between this quadratic and the old one is that 1.8 and the 
So if this is what the old quadratic is like completing the square, and the old quadratic is literally just 0 0.3 smaller than the new one, surely my new h is just going to be this stuff plus another 0 0.3. So it's basically just instead of 21.8, it's going to be 22.1 and then minus everything as normal, right? Squared, okay. So I've got some positive number and then minus, well, this thing is a squared number. So that always has to be positive. This, you know, makes it smaller, but it doesn't change the sign. So in other words, I've got this thing minus a positive number. So the smallest thing this can be is zero. In other words, when d equals 100, okay? So when d equals 100, I get my max h value. So my maximum h value is just going to be 22.1 because it's going to be 22.1 minus, and then that's going to go to zero. So the maximum height of the hole above the ground is 22.1 meters. The horizontal distance from the arch of the arrow when it's at its maximum height, I've actually done that already, and that's going to be 100 meters because of what I just did there. When d is 100, that is the value that maximizes this h. So the answer to the last part of the question is just 100 meters. Question 12, we're getting into the depths now. So in a controlled experiment, the number of microbes n present in the culture t days after the start of the experiment were counted. n and t are expected to satisfy a relationship of the form n equals at to the b and the constants. Show that this relationship can be expressed in the form all of this stuff. Okay, so something with logs in, right? We've got something that doesn't have logs in. We want something that does have logs in. What do you think we need to do? We need to take logs. What base are we going to take? Well, look what they have. They have logs to the base 10. So let's do that. So we're just going to take logs of both sides of the equation. So log 10 of the left-hand side of the equation equals log 10 of the right-hand side of the equation. Nothing too crazy here. What I can now do is use log laws to sort all of this out. So this is going to be, well, I don't, yeah, that's the same. <laughs> I don't really need to do anything to that. So what I can do first of all is I can use the addition law to split these two things up. So I can say that this is log to the base 10 of A plus log to the base 10 of T to the B. What I can now do is I can say that this is equal to b log 10 of t using the power law. So what I'm going to get, I'm going to get log 10 of n equals, let's pull myself over here, log 10 of a plus b log 10 of t. Show that this relationship can be expressed in the form log 10 n, cool equals log 10a plus, okay, so we're actually fine here because look what they want. They want m log 10 of t. So in other words, if I was to put this here and then they want a plus c on the end. So if I was to put this here, this thing is going to be my m and this whole thing is going to be my c. So here, m is equal to b, and then giving m and c in terms of, yep, perfect, and then c is equal to log to the base 10 of a. Fantastic. Okay, uh, part b. So figure 3 shows the line of best fit for values of log 10m plotted against values of log 10 of t. Use the information provided to estimate the number of microbes present in the culture three days after the start of the experiment. Right, okay. So there's quite a lot going on here. Let's get this graph up first of all. Okay, so look at the relationship that we have. n against t, it's not linear, is it? Because there's powers here. So if I was to plot n against t, it would not be a straight line. What we have just done in part a is we've shown that, you know what? If you instead plot the logs of these quantities against each other, then you're actually going to get a straight line. And why is that? Look at this thing here. My new y, as it were, is log 10 of n. So this equation would actually be y equals, and then I've got a c here, log 10 of t is my new x, and then I've got an m. So what we actually have here is a y equals mx plus c, is a straight line. So that's super useful, isn't it? Because here's the thing. 
we're going to want the values of A and B here. But we can use this graph to get those because we know that if we have y equals mx plus c, c is the y-intercept and m is the gradient. So I can say, well, you know what? In this case, I can see my y-intercept. Let's have a look at it. I reckon that this thing here is going to be, well, that would kind of be 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22, 1.23, 1.24, 1.25, 1.26, 1.27, 1.28, 1.29, 1.30, 1.31, 1.32, 1.33, 1.34, 1.35, 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, 1.41, 1.42, 1.43, 1.44, 1.45, 1.46, 1.47, 1.48, 1.49, 1.50, 1.51, 1.52, 1.53, 1.54, 1.55, 1.56, 1.57, 1.58, 1.59, 1.60, 1.61, 1.62, 1.63, 1.64, 1.65, 1.66, 1.67, 1.68, 1.69, 1.70, 1.71, 1.72, 1.73, 1.74, 1.75, 1.76, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79, 1.80, 1.81, 1.82, 1.83, 1.84, 1.85, 1.86, 1.87, 1.88, 1.89, 1.90, 1.91, 1.92, 1.93, 1.94, 1.95, 1.96, 1.97, 1.98, 1.99, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22, 1.23, 1.24, 1.25, 1.26, 1.27, 1.28, 1.29, 1.30, 1.31, 1.32, 1.33, 1.34, 1.35, 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, 1.41, 1.42, 1.43, 1.44, 1.45, 1.46, 1.47, 1.48, 1.49, 1.50, 1.51, 1.52, 1.53, 1.54, 1.55, 1.56, 1.57, 1.58, 1.59, 1.60, 1.61, 1.62, 1.63, 1.64, 1.65, 1.66, 1.67, 1.68, 1.69, 1.70, 1.71, 1.72, 1.73, 1.74, 1.75, 1.76, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79, 1.80, 1.81, 1.82, 1.83, 1.84, 1.85, 1.86, 1.87, 1.88, 1.89, 1.90, 1.91, 1.92, 1.93, 1.94, 1.95, 1.96, 1.97, 1.98, 1.99, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22, 1.23, 1.24, 1.25, 1.26, 1.27, 1.28, 1.29, 1.30, 1.31, 1.32, 1.33, 1.34, 1.35, 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, 1.41, 1.42, 1.43, 1.44, 1.45, 1.46, 1.47, 1.48, 1.49, 1.50, 1.51, 1.52, 1.53, 1.54, 1.55, 1.56, 1.57, 1.58, 1.59, 1.60, 1.61, 1.62, 1.63, 1.64, 1.65, 1.66, 1.67, 1.68, 1.69, 1.70, 1.71, 1.72, 1.73, 1.74, 1.75, 1.76, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79, 1.80, 1.81, 1.82, 1.83, 1.84, 1.85, 1.86, 1.87, 1.88, 1.89, 1.90, 1.91, 1.92, 1.93, 1.94, 1.95, 1.96, 1.97, 1.98, 1.99, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22, 1.23, 1.24, 1.25, 1.26, 1.27, 1.28, 1.29, 1.30, 1.31, 1.32, 1.33, 1.34, 1.35, 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, 1.41, 1.42, 1.43, 1.44, 1.45, 1.46, 1.47, 1.48, 1.49, 1.50, 1.51, 1.52, 1.53, 1.54, 1.55, 1.56, 1.57, 1.58, 1.59, 1.60, 1.61, 1.62, 1.63, 1.64, 1.65, 1.66, 1.67, 1.68, 1.69, 1.70, 1.71, 1.72, 1.73, 1.74, 1.75, 1.76, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79, 1.80, 1.81, 1.82, 1.83, 1.84, 1.85, 1.86, 1.87, 1.88, 1.89, 1.90, 1.91, 1.92, 1.93, 1.94, 1.95, 1.96, 1.97, 1.98, 1.99, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22, 1.23, 1.24, 1.25, 1.26, 1.27, 1.28, 1.29, 1.30, 1.31, 1.32, 1.33, 1.34, 1.35, 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, 1.41, 1.42, 1.43, 1.44, 1.45, 1.46, 1.47, 1.48, 1.49, 1.50, 1.51, 1.52, 1.53, 1.54, 1.55, 1.56, 1.57, 1.58, 1.59, 1.60, 1.61, 1.62, 1.63, 1.64, 1.65, 1.66, 1.67, 1.68, 1.69, 1.70, 1.71, 1.72, 1.73, 1.74, 1.75, 1.76, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79, 1.80, 1.81, 1.82, 1.83, 1.84, 1.85, 1.86, 1.87, 1.88, 1.89, 1.90, 1.91, 1.92, 1.93, 1.94, 1.95, 1.96, 1.97, 1.98, 1.99, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22, 1.23, 1.24, 1.25, 1.26, 1.27, 1.28, 1.29, 1.30, 1.31, 1.32, 1.33, 1.34, 1.35, 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, 1.41, 1.42, 1.43, 1.44, 1.45, 1.46, 1.47, 1.48, 1.49, 1.50, 1.51, 1.52, 1.53, 1.54, 1.55, 1.56, 1.57, 1.58, 1.59, 1.60, 1.61, 1.62, 1.63, 1.64, 1.65, 1.66, 1.67, 1.68, 1.69, 1.70, 1.71, 1.72, 1.73, 1.74, 1.75, 1.76, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79, 1.80, 1.81, 1.82, 1.83, 1.84, 1.85, 1.86, 1.87, 1.88, 1.89, 1.90, 1.91, 1.92, 1.93, 1.94, 1.95, 1.96, 1.97, 1.98, 1.99, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22, 1.23, 1.24, 1.25, 1.26, 1.27, 1.28, 1.29, 1.30, 1.31, 1.32, 1.33, 1.34, 1.35, 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, 1.41, 1.42, 1.43, 1.44, 1.45, 1.46, 1.47, 1.48, 1.49, 1.50, 1.51, 1.52, 1.53, 1.54, 1.55, 1.56, 1.57, 1.58, 1.59, 1.60, 1.61, 1.62, 1.63, 1.64, 1.65, 1.66, 1.67, 1.68, 1.69, 1.70, 1.71, 1.72, 1.73, 1.74, 1.75, 1.76, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79, 1.80, 1.81, 1.82, 1.83, 1.84, 1.85, 1.86, 1.87, 1.88, 1.89, 1.90, 1.91, 1.92, 1.93, 1.94, 1.95, 1.96, 1.97, 1.98, 1.99, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22, 1.23, 1.24, 1.25, 1.26, 1.27, 1.28, 1.29, 1.30, 1.31, 1.32, 1.33, 1.34, 1.35, 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, 1.41, 1.42, 1.43, 1.44, 1.45, 1.46, 1.47, 1.48, 1.49, 1.50, 1.51, 1.52, 1.53, 1.54, 1.55, 1.56, 1.57, 1.58, 1.59, 1.60, 1.61, 1.62, 1.63, 1.64, 1.65, 1.66, 1.67, 1.68, 1.69, 1.70, 1.71, 1.72, 1.73, 1.74, 1.75, 1.76, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79, 1.80, 1.81, 1.82, 1.83, 1.84, 1.85, 1.86, 1.87, 1.88, 1.89, 1.90, 1.91, 1.92, 1.93, 1.94, 1.95, 1.96, 1.97, 1.98, 1.99, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22, 1.23, 1.24, 1.25, 1.26, 1.27, 1.28, 1.29, 1.30, 1.31, 1.32, 1.33, 1.34, 1.35, 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, 1.41, 1.42, 1.43, 1.44, 1.45, 1.46, 1.47, 1.48, 1.49, 1.50, 1.51, 1.52, 1.53, 1.54, 1.55, 1.56, 1.57, 1.58, 1.59, 1.60, 1.61, 1.62, 1.63, 1.64, 1.65, 1.66, 1.67, 1.68, 1.69, 1.70, 1.71, 1.72, 1.73, 1.74, 1.75, 1.76, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79, 1.80, 1.81, 1.82, 1.83, 1.84, 1.85, 1.86, 1.87, 1.88, 1.89, 1.90, 1.91, 1.92, 1.93, 1.94, 1.95, 1.96, 1.97, 1.98, 1.99, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22, 1.23, 1.24, 1.25, 1.26, 1.27, 1.28, 1.29, 1.30, 1.31, 1.32, 1.33, 1.34, 1.35, 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, 1.41, 1.42, 1.43, 1.44, 1.45, 1.46, 1.47, 1.48, 1.49, 1.50, 1.51, 1.52, 1.53, 1.54, 1.55, 1.56, 1.57, 1.58, 1.59, 1.60, 1.61, 1.62, 1.63, 1.64, 1.65, 1.66, 1.67, 1.68, 1.69, 1.70, 1.71, 1.72, 1.73, 1.74, 1.75, 1.76, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79, 1.80, 1.81, 1.82, 1.83, 1.84, 1.85, 1.86, 1.87, 1.88, 1.89, 1.90, 1.91, 1.92, 1.93, 1.94, 1.95, 1.96, 1.97, 1.98, 1.99, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22, 1.23, 1.24, 1.25, 1.26, 1.27, 1.28, 1.29, 1.30, 1.31, 1.32, 1.33, 1.34, 1.35, 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, 1.41, 1.42, 1.43, 1.44, 1.45, 1.46, 1.47, 1.48, 1.49, 1.50, 1.51, 1.52, 1.53, 1.54, 1.55, 1.56, 1.57, 1.58, 1.59, 1.60, 1.61, 1.62, 1.63, 1.64, 1.65, 1.66, 1.67, 1.68, 1.69, 1.70, 1.71, 1.72, 1.73, 1.74, 1.75, 1.76, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79, 1.80, 1.81, 1.82, 1.83, 1.84, 1.85, 1.86, 1.87, 1.88, 1.89, 1.90, 1.91, 1.92, 1.93, 1.94, 1.95, 1.96, 1.97, 1.98, 1.99, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18, 1.19, 1.20, 1.21, 1.22, 1.23, 1.24, 1.25, 1.26, 1.27, 1.28, 1.29, 1.30, 1.31, 1.32, 1.33, 1.34, 1.35, 1.36, 1.37, 1.38, 1.39, 1.40, 1.41, 1.42, 1.43, 1.44, 1.45, 1.46, 1.47, 1.48, 1.49, 1.50, 1.51, 1.52, 1.53, 1.54, 1.55, 1.56, 1.57, 1.58, 1.59, 1.60, 1.61, 1.62, 1.63, 1.64, 1.65, 1.66, 1.67, 1.68, 1.69, 1.70, 1.71, 1.72, 1.73, 1.74, 1.75, 1.76, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79, 1.80, 1.81, 1.82, 1.83, 1.84, 1.85, 1.86, 1.87, 1.88, 1.89, 1.90, 1.91, 1.92, 1.93, 1.94, 1.95, 1.96, 1.97, 1.98, 1.99, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1
it's just going to go on like this forever. That is that is that would be an incorrect assumption, and that's actually in statistics called extrapolation. You have something called interpolation, which is when you're making estimates within the kind of data. So it would be, you know, it would probably be fair to say, okay, well then maybe around here you could do that. That that would be okay. But then if we start kind of estimating stuff over here, well, wait a minute, we have no data. Like, it behaved in a straight line like this, but no one has a clue what's going to happen for much larger values. So let's have a think about this. A million. If n is a million, what would that correspond to in terms of log 10 of n? Well, log to the base 10 of a million, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, is 6. That's because 10 to the power of 6 is a million. So look at this. 6 is way, way off this graph, isn't it? So here's what I would say. I would say, look, it's extrapolation. Um, you know, estimating values. I know for these numbers would be extrapolation. So really, you know, you have no idea if it's going to behave the same. So, you know, um, this is unknown if the model, you know, will still kind of apply or be more or less valid for those numbers. You are outside of the data. Bit, bit of a statsy question there, I reckon. So that was, yeah, a bit of a cheeky one. So with reference to the model, interpret the value of the constant a, so n equals a t to the b. Usually, you have a lot of like exponential models where usually a is the initial. Uh, like for example, if you had something like n equals, I don't know, a e to the k t or something like that, then a would be the initial because when t equals zero, then n would equal a, right? Because e to the zero is one. So in that case, it would be like, oh, well, it's like the initial amount. But in this case, it's actually slightly different because the t is down here. So when would n equal a, right? What would t have to be? If t was 1, then n would equal a times 1 to the b. Well, 1 to the power of b we know is just going to be 1. So I think that the relevance in this case would basically be the number of microbes present after one day. Present after one day. Now that's a cheeky one. I saw that and I was like, oh, it's going to be initial because vast majority of the time when we have these kind of models, it's the more exponential. But in this case, it is actually a bit different. So you really have to be careful, read it properly. 13, surely we're going to be done soon. Okay, so we've got some more parametrics on the go. X is two cos T. Y is root three cos of two T. Find an expression for, do you have any X in terms of T? All right, do you have any X? you need to remember this, is just dy by dt, all divided by dx by dt. You can kind of think of this in a slightly naive way of just look, like, dt's cancel, cool, everyone's a winner. So essentially, you just individually differentiate each of these parametric equations. So dx by dt, cos goes to minus sine, so it's minus two sine t, dy by dt, so I need to use the chain rule here. So I need to differentiate the inside function. So that's going to be two. The root three is chilling there. And then the cos of two t is going to go to a sine of two t. And it's going to be minus as well. So it's going to be like that. Fantastic. Uh, so then basically, I just sub both of these things in. So I'll say therefore, dy by dx is just going to equal minus two root three sine of 2t, all divided by minus 2 sine of t. Fantastic. You can simplify this a bit. They don't ask you to, but we can at least, you know, cancel the minus 2s. Now, technically, you could actually get rid of a bit more here as well, because sine of 2t is 2 sine t cos t. Yeah, why don't we do it? Why don't we do it? So essentially, sine of 2t is 2 sine t cos t, and then I'm dividing by that sine t on the bottom, aren't I? So this actually cancels pretty nicely to just get 2 root 3 cos t. They didn't ask for that, so you would have got the marks if you just stopped there. Um, cool.
Cool. So the point P lies on C, where T is 2 pi by 3. The line L <clears throat> is the normal to C at P. Show that equation for line L is all of that stuff. Okay, a normal is a straight line. What two things do we always need to get the equation of a straight line? We need a point and the gradient. If we have those two things, we're laughing. So the normal is perpendicular to a tangent. So if we were to sub t equals 2 pi by 3 into this, we're going to get the gradient of a tangent at that point. And then we're just going to get the reciprocal gradient. So what we're going to do is we're going to say uh, when t is 2 pi by 3 dy by dx is equal to 2 root 3 cos of 2 pi by 3. Now, make sure your calculator is in radians. Radians, radians, radians. Calculus, radians, not degrees. It's not going to tell you, but it's in radians, okay? So, we're going to go set up angle unit radians. And now we can do right 2 times the square root of 3 multiplied by cos of 2 pi by 3. That's going to get me minus root 3. Are we done? So this is going to be the gradient of a tangent, but the normal is perpendicular. So what do I do? I do minus 1 divided by that, which in this case is 1 over root 3. Okay, so I've got my m in this. I now need my x1 and my y1. Well, how am I going to get that? I'm going to sub this t value in 2 the initial parametric equations. So my x1, y1 is going to be what? 2 cos of 2 pi by 3, and then root 3 cos of, well, 2 times 2 pi by 3, so 4 pi by 3. So they're going to be what? 2 cos of 2 pi by 3 will be minus 1, and root 3 3 cos of 4 pi by 3, we are getting there, we are getting there, is going to be minus root 3 over 2. Right, hope all this works. So straight in here, we're going to get y minus y1, so plus root 3 over 2, is equal to m, 1 over root 3, times x minus minus 1, so x plus 1. Cool, let's quickly look at what they want. So you can see that there's no fractions in what they have, so I think a great first step would be to multiply by this root 3. So let's do that now. I'm going to get root 3y plus root 3 times root 3 is 3, 3 over 2, equals, and now I've just got 1 here, so 1 times this bracket is just that bracket, so x plus 1. So it looks like they have everything just on one side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take everything onto the right-hand side. So I'm going to get x plus 1 minus 3 over 2 minus root 3y is equal to 0. Why haven't we got the answer yet? Because it looks like they multiplied everything by 2. So I'm going to get 2x plus 2 minus 3 minus 2 root 3y. Right, tell me this is right. So what did the 2x? We're good. Plus 2 minus 3 is minus 1. They've got one of them chilling on the end. And then the minus 2 root 3y equal 0. Boom. Right, last part. The line L intersects the curve C again at the point Q. Find the exact coordinates of Q. Uh, all right, so if we were to... Uh, well, I suppose what we could do is we could sub in the initial parametric equations into this equation for the normal, right? Because if you think about it, this is simultaneous equations, right? It's points of intersection. So what we can do is we can say, you know what? 2, and then instead of x, I'm going to say 2 cos t. So 2 times 2 cos t minus 2 root 3y, which is all of this stuff, which is root 3 cos of 2t, minus 1 equals 0. Okay, so clean all this up and then let's see if we can do anything nice. So I'm going to get 4 cos of t minus root 3 times root 3 is 3, times that by 2 to get 6, cos of 2t minus 1 equals 0. Now, 
Um, this is a problem because this is a 2t and this is a t, so I can't really... They're just separate variables at the moment. However, I can use a double angle formula here. Now, cos of 2t is equal to cos squared t minus sine squared t. Now, you have the multiple angle formula in your formula book, but you don't have the double one. So you can either remember this or remember how to derive it using the one in your formula book. Just let A and B both be T in your formula book, like you should get this. What you can then do is you can swap this out for a one minus cos squared T. So now I'm just gonna get this in terms of cos. Now this is useful because chucking this back in here, what am I gonna get? I'm gonna get four cos T minus six lots of two cos squared T minus one minus the other one equals zero. So this is going to be a quadratic in cos. So let's clean it up and kind of show you what I mean. So what we're going to get, we're going to get 4 cos t minus 12 cos squared t plus 6 minus 1 equals 0. Chuck it all onto the right because I'd like this to be positive. So I'm going to get 12 cos squared t minus 4 cos t. Uh, and then, well, this is going to be positive 5 on this side. Chuck it over to that side. It's going to be negative 5. So, that's now going to equal zero. What now? So, it's a quadratic, you know? If I let y, for example, y well, is probably a bad idea because it's already defining the question. And if anything, let's go Greek. I'm going Greek, alpha, right? This is gonna be what? 12 alpha squared minus four alpha minus five equals zero. Now, if you're cleverer than me, you might be able to factorize this. <laughs> I'm using my calculator, mate. Right, so menu. Down here, equation funk, we've done this before, polynomial, degree two, I'm gonna put 12 in for the x squared coefficient, minus four in for the x coefficient, minus five for the number on the end, to get alpha equals five over six, or alpha equals minus a half. In other words, cos t either equals five over six, or it equals minus a half. Okay, so first thing worth mentioning is that I don't actually think we need to get t here. You know, usually you would probably be inclined to go, okay, well then you get, get the, you know, get the value of t by going on the trig graphs and all that madness and then sub it into the initial equations, all of that. But if you look at the initial equations, they're just in terms of cos. So I don't need to mess about with all of the inverse trig and all of that, because look, here, I have x and y just in terms of cos t. So for this solution, if we call this, you know, solution one, well then I'm gonna get x equals two cos t, so two times five over six, and then y equals root three. Now remember, it's cos of two t, but we know that cos of two t is just two cos squared t minus one. So what I can do here is I can say that that is just gonna be 2 cos t all squared, so 5 over 6 squared minus 1. So work these out. I've not had to do any inverse trig, so this is just going to be 5 over 3, isn't it? This is going to be something. <laughs> Let's leave this root 3 out of the bracket for now, and then just in your calculator, let's just work out what's on the inside. So it's going to be 2 multiplied by 5 over 6 squared minus one. That's going to be seven over 18. So it's going to be seven root three over 18. Bit mad. So is that different to the coordinates I got last time? Because remember, my x1, y1 for the initial coordinates of the normal were minus one minus root three over two. So Obviously, the equations that I was solving below were trying to solve, you know, the intersections. One of them is this, okay? So that's going to be the coordinates of P. And then the other one is going to be this one here. So we know that the coordinates of Q are 5 over 3, 7 root 3 over 18. And that if I was to do the same thing but with cos t equals minus a half, it would have just got me the coordinates of P again. Question 14 also looks pretty hard. So figure four shows a sketch of the part of the curve C with equation y equals x squared over x over three minus two x plus five. 
finite region S shown in figure four is bounded by the curve C, the Langlois equation is equals one. The x axis and the x axis, they're just saying what we can see, right? The table below shows corresponding values of x and y with the values of y given to four decimal places. Cool. Use the trapezium rule. Okay, so trapezium rule basically gives us an approximation for an integral or the area under a curve. Again, it's in your formula book. I'm not going to explain the whole thing now and where it comes from. The good news is, if it's in your formula booklet, you could actually just get the marks having no idea what it's on about. So that's the great thing about this. If there's anything we've learned today, it's that learn what is in your formula booklet. Basically, what does it do? It tells us that it's going to be approximated by h over 2, and then what is it? It's going to be my end one, so y0 plus yn, plus two lots of all the middle ones. So y1 plus y2 all the way up to y of n minus 1. That's what they have in the formula booklet. Cool. So essentially, h is going to be the width of each kind of strip on the x-axis, which in this case is going to be 1.5 because there's 1.5, 0.5, because there's a 0.5 difference between these x values. So that is going to be 0.5. And then the all of these y0 to yn are just our y values there. So my y0 is going to be 3, the first y value, and my yn is going to be the 2.2958, the last one. So in this case, it's going to be the one lot of the first and the last ones, and then plus two times all of the middle ones. So 2.3041 plus 1.9242. Plus 1.9089. Horrible looking stuff. But again, straight to the calculator. No worries at all. So this is going to get me 0.5 over 2 is a quarter, right? So let's put that outside. We're going to get 3 plus 2.29. It's just an exercise in calculator, isn't it, really? Okay, plus 2 and then another bracket, you know, making sure you get all your brackets down. 2.3041 plus 1, and in reading my handwriting, which is probably the hardest thing in this whole paper, 9242 plus 1.9089. Close off my two brackets, and we want three decimal places. So to three decimal places, I get that as 4.393, because it's 255. Cool, okay. Uh, explain how the trapezium rule could be used to obtain a more accurate estimate. More strips. It's always more strips. Because it's basically just, you know, the smaller the trapezium you get, the more accurate, the less kind of your over or under. So yeah, just more strips, basically. A strip being a trapezium. So yeah, that should always really do it. Pretty standard answer there. Show that the exact area of S. Oh no, here we go. There we go. Can be written in the form A over B plus Lun C. Now then, it's probably all going to start kicking off here because we actually have to integrate this thing. So, <laughs> right. We need to essentially work out the following. We need to work out the integral between 1 and 3 of this whole thing. x squared ln x over 3 minus 2x plus 5. Okay, so that's my answer. <laughs> Not really. I need to do it. So... Let's, this looks grim. What I'm going to do is I'm going to separately do this and then we can think about everything else later on, okay? So I think the best way to do this is to just say, look, even forgetting about limits or anything, let me just try and work out the integral of x squared ln x over 3 and then we can, we can, you know, jump in with whatever later on. So, um, it's going to be parts here because we've got two things multiplied together. That's the only thing I can do. It's going to be parts. So, look, you get integration by parts in the formula booklet as well. So let me let me give it to you now. So this is basically going to be u, I believe they do it this way, dv by dx. So as in, if I want to integrate these two things multiplied together, the answer is going to be, what's it going to be again? It's going to be v u minus the integral of du by dx times v, right? So, what are we saying here? v is going to be the integral of whatever this thing is. du by dx is the derivative of this thing. So looking at what we have, what we need to do is we need to identify, you know what the first thing I'm going to do is? I'm just going to take this third outside. 
you can take constants outside of integrals and they just make your life easier. So now there's no threes anywhere. So now I can just really focus on these two things and then just whatever I get, put a third on the outside. Okay, so essentially I'm gonna wanna integrate one of these and differentiate another one. And then in the resulting interval, hopefully that thing turns out nice and then I can integrate that. Now usually, usually I would say to differentiate x's or powers of x. However, there is one exception, and that is when we have lens. When we have a lens, like what's the integral of lens? It's not something nice. So this is the only case in which I'm going to say, you know what? I'm going to actually choose to differentiate this lens and then integrate this thing. So what that would mean is that my dv by dx here would be x squared. My u would be ln x, because now I can get these other components, can't I? Because I can say v would just be the integral of this, so x cubed over 3. And then du by dx would be the derivative of this, so 1 over x. So at this point, I can just grab these four things and just chuck it directly into this formula. So let's do that. Let's bring u down here, and then we're just going to go, okay? So what we're going to do is... We're going to absolutely miss everything, of course. So there we go. Now, so straight in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that a third, I seem to have lost the plot, a third times by the integral of x squared ln x dx is equal to, okay, v u. So v is going to be x cubed over 3 u is going to be ln x. Even the whiteboard's just having it at this point. It's worked too hard today. ln x minus the integral of du by dx, which is 1 over x, times by v, which is x cubed over 3. So what I can now do, that's not quite it because I've still got this third outside. So this whole thing is going to be times by a third. Okay. So let's multiply this third out of the first term. So this is now going to be x cubed over 9 times ln x and then minus. OK, so what I'm going to do here, I've got a third outside this and then I've also got a third from here. So this is also going to be a ninth. And what we're going to be left with x cubed over x, which is x squared. This is grim, isn't it? This is grim, right? OK, and now I integrate this. So this is going to be x cubed over 9, ln x, minus, okay, so this is going to be x cubed over 3, but I've still got a 9th, so this is now going to be x cubed over 27. Now, I would usually get a plus c here, but because I'm actually just going to sub it into a definite integral, I'm not going to worry about that now. Okay, so the bigger picture is what? It's the following. I now have, obviously, my initial integral that I want, which is, you know, the x squared ln x over 3, and I'm now doing it between 3 and 1, and then it's minus 2x plus 5. I can now integrate because I know what this integrates to. It's this stuff here. So this thing here is going to be x cubed over 9 ln x minus x cubed over 27. It's not pretty, is it? Like, this is, it's not pretty. Um... That's just, these two terms are going to come from that, and then I just integrate these two as normal, but they're not as bad. Don't forget your dx's. See, even I'm forgetting dx's, because this, this is what this question's doing to me, right? Okay, so this is going to go to x squared, and this is going to go to 5x. Right, I'm now going to sub 3 and wide. Woo! Right, I'm just going to go here, because there's more space. I usually like to line up my equals, but this is desperate times, right? So, one big bracket is going to be subbing in 3, minus another big bracket subbing in 1. Okay, 3 cubed over 9. 3 cubed is 27, divide that by 9, you get 3. Learn 3. Minus 3 cubed is 27, divide that by 27, you get 1, which is nice. 3 squared is 9. 3 times 5 is 15. Okay, 1. 1 cubed is 1, so 1 over 9, learn 1 minus 1 over 27, minus 1 plus 5. All right, let's, let's go, let's go. So we get 3 and 3. Okay, minus 1 minus 9 is going to be minus 10. Add 15 is going to be plus 5. Minus, okay, uh, ln 1 luckily is 0, so that's going. 
and then I get minus 1 over 27, minus 1 plus 5. Calculator time, I can't be bothered not putting that on my calculator. So I get minus 1 over 27, minus 1 plus 5, and that gets me 107 over 27. So I want to take this away. So I think at that point I don't need a bracket anymore. Get rid of that. What now? So A over B plus ln C. Okay, so well, let's sort out this number here. So I'm going to do 5 minus 107 over 27, which is 28 over 27. So I'm going to get a 28 over 27 here. And then plus 3 ln 3. Are we done yet? No, because we want A over B plus ln C. I don't want a 3 in front of it, so I can use the power law here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this is ln of 3 cubed. And for the last time, 3 cubed is 27. So I'm going to get 28 over 27 plus ln of 27. Ugh. And then, basically just to finish off, what I'm going to get, A is going to be 28, B is going to be 27, and C is going to be 27. I apologise for that. That was absolutely horrible. Hopefully we have almost finished this paper. All right, last question. <laughs> what is that? All right, you know, it's the last question. Say level maths. They're not gonna make it easy for you, are they? All right, let's have a look at it. So figure five shows a sketch of the curve with equation. F of x equals four sine of two x over e to the square root of two times x minus one. It has a maximum at P and a minimum at Q, as shown in the diagram. Show that the X coordinates of P and Q are solutions of the equation all at roof. Right. I think this is going to get a bit dense here, so let's let's kind of get cracking. So, um, how do we get stationary points? You know, minimum, maximum. It's by setting dy by dx equal to zero, or in our case, you know, f prime of x equal to zero. So all we need to do here is that. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but that's what we need to do. So quotient rule. <laughs> we're going to need to differentiate this whole thing. We've got a fraction. We're going to use the quotient rule. Again, it's in your formula booklet. Oh, we know it's in a pattern here. So f prime of x. Okay, so here's the way I, I don't even look at the formula booklet. I just think of it like this. I say, write down the bottom, differentiate the top. So this is going to be write down the bottom, differentiate the top. So I'm going to use the chain rule here. So the four is just chilling out the front, and then I differentiate the inside, so it's going to be two, and then the sine is going to go to cos, so that's going to be cos of two x. Minus, differentiate the bottom right down the top, so four sine of two x, multiplied by the derivative of the bottom. So again, with the e, I'm going to differentiate the inner function, so I'm going to differentiate the root two x minus one, that's just going to be root two. And then the e is just going to go to itself. 2x minus 1. Not even got enough space on my fraction. All over the bottom squared. So that is going to be all of that squared. Can I do anything? Yes, I can cancel an e to the root 2x minus 1, can't I? So that's going to leave me with 4 times 2, so 8. Whiteboard stops again. 8 cos of 2x. That's gone. Minus 4 root 2 sine 2x. 2x all divided by just one lot now of that disgusting old thing. Okay, but the good news is I want to solve this being equal to zero, don't I? So what I can do is I can say, well, okay, equal zero. If I have this fraction equal to zero, then surely it just must mean the top must equal zero. Another way of thinking of that is let's multiply both left and right by this thing. What do I get? I'm going to get 8 cos. 2x minus 4 root 2 sine of 2x equals 0. Clean it up. I think we're getting there. Let's cancel a 4, yeah? So I'm going to get cos 2, lots of cos. Don't get ahead of yourself. 2x minus root 2 sine 2x equals 0. Take the sine on the other side. I'm going to get 2 cos 2x equals Root 2 sine 2x, two I'm getting there. I can, can feel it. Divide by root 2, what are we going to get? Well, 2 divided by root 2 is just going to be root 2, right? Because root 2 times root 2 is 2. So I'm actually going to get root 2 cos 2x equals sine of 2x. 
divide left and right by cos of 2x because I know that there's a trig identity that says sine over cos is tan. So I'm going to get tan 2x equals root 2. Cool. Using your answer to part A, find the x coordinates of the minimum turning point on the curve with equation y equals f of 2x. <sighs> okay, well, if I this is y equals f of x here, isn't it? This is me saying, okay, where is the turning point for y equals f of x? So surely if I just want the turning point for y equals f of 2x, instead I would just have to solve root 2 equals tan of 2 times 2x, right? So this is tan of 4x. So let's kind of try and work it out. So I essentially want to solve the equation tan of 4x equals root 2. Um, let's have a kind of think here about the tan graph really quickly. So tan graph is going to look, you know, on a, on a rough, on a rough way, it's going to look something like, you want to see me butcher a tan graph, right? So I'm going to get one of these little chunks here. You know what? In fear of messing the next one up, I'm going to copy and paste it. Right, let's go about there. Two chunks is all I want right now, and you're going to see why. Am I going to want the first solution of this equation? Let's have a think. I want the minimum turning point. Look at the graph. Why have they given us this graph? Because it shows that P, the maximum, is the first turning point. The second turning point is that minimum, isn't it? The Q. So I'm going to get two solutions for this thing here. The first one is going to correspond to P, the max. The second one, the one that I want, is going to correspond to the Q the min and that is the one that I want. So what am I going to do? <laughs> it's a great question. I'm going to do the inverse tan of this thing here to get solutions for 4x basically and then divide by 4 and get all my solutions. So I'm going to get 4x is equal to, let's do the inverse tan of root 2, making sure I'm in radians again please. So this is going to be that horrible old thing. So it's going to be 0 0.955 dot, dot, dot. I want to save this as ants. That's going to be the first one here. Not necessarily P, but I'll show you in a second. That's going to be the one that corresponds to P. But I want this one, don't I? How do I get the jumps in tan? I add pi. So I'm now going to do this answer in my calculator plus pi. And that's going to get me... 4.0969 dot, 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 dot. So then the one that I care about, you know, the one at Q is just going to be X equals, and then I'm going to divide this one by four. So answer divided by four, and then I'm going to round it to, let's go three sig fig. There's going to be 1.02. Fantastic. Okay. Last part of the last question. So we're almost there. Okay, so y equals 3 minus 2 f of x. Okay, this is interesting. Interesting for a couple of reasons. The first one is that we're actually, we only care about the x-coordinate here. But look at all of the transformations of this new, of this new graph. The x is not affected at all. All of these transformations, you know, the 3, the 3 is just kind of adding it in the y, so that x coordinate doesn't change at all. You know, if I have a graph, right? If I have something like this, and then I add 3 to it, well, it adds 3 here, but this coordinate, you know, this x coordinate of the, of the ma minimum, maximum, doesn't change at all. The y one does, but it doesn't change. The x one doesn't at all. Secondly, that minus 2, well, it's going to do two things. It's going to stretch it in the y by a scale factor of 2, but again going up or down, not going to affect the x coordinate. But then it's also going to flip it round. So that's not going to affect the x coordinates, but it's going to do something interesting. Because this, at this point, is a max, right? But if I was to do the following, you know what? I'm going to go a different colour here. If I was to reflect this in the x-axis, which is what that minus is doing, so, you know, maybe it'd do something like that, this max is now going to turn into a min, isn't it? 
and the min is now going to turn into a max. So, nothing that, you know, goes on here with the 3 and the minus 2 changes the x coordinates of the stationary points at all, but it does change the max into a min and the min into a max. In other words, I'm actually still just solving this tan of x equal, tan of 2x equals root 2 here. That's not changing. The coordinates of the turning points aren't changing, but now what I'm looking for, because I want the x coordinate of the minimum turning point, the first one is now going to be the minimum. So on a similar kind of note to when I was doing this tan graph here, so you know what, let's grab this. What I'm now looking for is the first one, because this is now going to correspond to a minimum point. Cool. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to do with this whole video and paper is going to be the following. I'm going to get the inverse tan of root 2, which I believe I already got, which was this. You know what? I've got it up here, but I've not written all the accuracy. So what I do want to do is just get it into my calculator again so I can get it stored as ants, basically. So I'm just going to quickly do the inverse tan of root 2 again. And now what I'm going to do, you know, which is the 0 0.955, etc. And I don't care about this solution because, again, this is now the min. So the final answer is just going to be this answer divided by 2 to get 0 0.478. And I believe that that is the final answer. And that concludes the paper.